I wanna tell you a story today. It's a story about a nation, it's a story about war, it's a story about freedom. But to do that, I need to take you back in time. So I wanna take you back to 600 years before Jesus was born. To the, the year is 600 BC. Now you may not realize this, but you know a lot of people uh, that are famous around that time. For example, shortly after 600 BC, the Buddha will be born in India. Uh, over in China, Confucius will soon be born and begin writing his rules for living the good life. Uh, in Greece, Pythagoras, the guy whose theorem plagued so many of us in junior high algebra, is living in Greece and he coming up with his mathematics. Let's see, in our uh, hemisphere, in Central America, the Olmec civilization is coming to an end. And you know them, you just don't realize you know them. Those are the guys that carved those huge stone heads for no discernible reason whatsoever. Anyway, that's what's going on in the world. But meanwhile, in the Middle East, the Israelites are not having a good time of it. You see, before 600 BC, they'd had David and Solomon and they were following God. God had brought them out of Egypt, given them the law of Moses, and when they served God, they prospered. But for some time, they had placed their trust in other things besides God. They'd placed their trust in the gods of the culture, same kind of gods that we serve, whether it's the place their trust in their military or their finances, uh, or the land, or their alliances, whatever it was, for their security and safety. And it turns out they had misplaced their trust. You see, in 600 BC, the great power in the world, by the way, I brought a map, because I think you need to visualize this. <laughs> so this is a map of the world in 600 BC. You have two great powers that are controlling the geopolitics of the world then. You have Egypt in the south, and you have Babylon in the north. Now Babylon, their capital city, Babylon, is really close to Baghdad, Iraq. And so just to give you an orientation today, the Babylonians originated in what's modern day Iraq. And so they want to conquer Egypt because Egypt has gold and grain and riches galore. But to do that, they need to march south through what's modern day Lebanon and Syria and Israel to get to Egypt, to battle the Egyptians and hopefully conquer them. So the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, he does that. He takes his army and he marches through goes through what's modern day Lebanon, goes through what's modern day Syria, but was also Syria in 600 BC, goes through Israel, but he didn't destroy everything. I mean, that wouldn't make sense. What he wanted was taxes. And so he came to the kings of those nations and he came to the king of Israel and he said this, listen, I'm going to fight the Egyptians and you're gonna serve me or I'm gonna destroy you. He said, we need taxes. We have Medicare for all in Babylon, and so we need more. Ta okay, that was a joke. I know I'm going to get emails. I'm sorry. <laughs> but they did want tax money. They, wanted, they called it tribute, but it was taxes. And he said, so I'll destroy you, or you can pay me taxes. Well, the king of Israel said, we would love to pay you taxes, and they paid exorbitant taxes. In fact, it, they impoverished those nations so that they would pay to Babylon. And, but the king... Nebuchadnezzar is no fool. He said, you know, just to make sure you send those checks every month, I'm going to take some people with me as hostages. And so what the Babylonians did, and this was their custom, they would take the best and the brightest of the young men and women, and they would take some of the leading citizens back to Babylon as kind of insurance policy that they would keep paying. Well, the scripture says when Nebuchadnezzar was there, he took 11,000 of the Israelites back to Babylon with him. He took young men and women. For example, Daniel. If you have read the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, Daniel was a young man who was taken to Babylon around this time. But there was another young man named Ezekiel. Ezekiel is in his mid-20s at this time, and he is taken back to Babylon with the other 11,000. And so they become exiles, meaning they're living in a land not their own, 
And so the king of Israel, as they withdraw, begins to pay the taxes. Well, the taxes are bankrupting Israel, and that is going to affect his ability to remain king because his people say, you're not providing public services. So he's in a real political dilemma. So he decides to play some balance of power politics. So he reaches out to Egypt, and Pharaoh talks to him, and he says, listen, I too would like to conquer Babylon, and I know they're charging you a lot of money. Why don't you come over to my side? I'll charge you less money. You can pay taxes to me, and it'll be less. And if the Babylonians come, we'll team up, and we can defeat them. And so the king of Israel makes a political decision that he's going to throw in his lot with the Egyptians. Well, they stop paying the taxes. A couple of months go by, they get a call from the Babylonian collections department. Hey, we haven't seen your check lately. And so they get away with it for a while, like, hey, it's in the mail. Must have gotten lost. Well, after a while, Babylonians realize, and Nebuchadnezzar realizes, these guys have stopped paying. These guys are rebelling. I'll bet they are in alliance with the Egyptians. And so he gathers up a great army, and he marches down toward Israel. When the Israelite king hears this, he gets on the phone, he calls the Pharaoh, nothing but voicemail. I mean, he can't get in touch with him at all. Turns out, he placed his trust in the wrong guy. And sure enough, in 586 BC, the Babylonians come through and completely destroy Israel. They destroyed Jerusalem. They killed hundreds of thousands of Jews. They went up on the Temple Mount and they destroyed the temple. Nebuchadnezzar said, not only am I going to destroy your people, I'm going to destroy your God. And he destroyed the temple as well. And he took almost all of the Jews and marched them back to Babylon to become slaves to the Babylonian Empire. And he just left it. And the neighbors came in and took their homes and took their fields and, and just overran the nation of Israel. So all these Israelites are in exile, meaning they're taken away from their homes and they're planted in Babylon. And to, from a historian's point of view, that should have been the end of the Jewish people. There are so many people in history that have been conquered. You don't know their names, and the reason you don't know their names is they simply faded away from history. And that's exactly what should happen to the Jews. I mean, over time, you intermarry, you just basically get assimilated, and you cease to exist as a people. I mean, in 2,600 years, not even Ancestry.com could trace you back to actually being an Israelite at that point. So they should have disappeared from history. Well, let me pause for a second because one of the lessons that I want us to get out of this is simply this, and I'm really passionate about this. The stories in your Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, are not once upon a time fairy tales. This story really happened in real history to real people, and God was working through it. You see, that's important because if this is a once upon a time, there were people named the Israelites, you might draw a good moral to the story and say, oh, the moral of the story is don't place your trust in things that will fail you. Well, that's nice, but that's not real. The truth is this is real history, real people, real geopolitics, real economics. It's just like our world and God is working in it. And that's important. Because if God can work in the real world in 600 BC, he can work in the real world today. And he can work in your life today. So, end of the story. You think they're gone, they're done. Well, this young man Ezekiel, though, as he sits there amongst all the Israelites and they're mourning. By the way, Jeremiah, another prophet, another book in your Old Testament, was also living at this time. He wrote a little book called Lamentations. The book of Lamentations, let me just put it this way. If you're ever just exuberantly happy, read Lamentations. It'll bring you right back down. <laughs> but that book is written about this exact time. They're just, whoa, oh Lord, we have placed our trust in things that, that did not, they failed us and we are doomed and we did it to ourselves. And it's just a book of crying out to God. So that's what's happening. But a vision of the Lord comes to this young man, Ezekiel. And that's our text for today. I want to tell you one of the visions that came to him. It's in Ezekiel chapter 37. And I'm going to read you the first 14 verses. 
It says, the hand of the Lord was upon me, Ezekiel, this young man, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord. This is a vision. And he set me down in the middle of a valley. The valley was full of bones, and he led me around among them, and listen, there were very, very many bones on the surface of the valley, and I saw that they were very dry. Let me pause there for a second, because this Hebrew word that's translated very dry literally means drier than an accounting convention. I mean, it's it really dry, okay? I might have made that up. But anyway, it's really dry. And he said, and these bones were very dry. And God said to me, son of man, which is going to be a messianic title later, but right now it just means little man, human being. He says, can these bones live? And I answered, oh, Lord God, only you know. I mean, no, <laughs> that's what he's thinking. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones. Prophesy means to speak Hear the word of the Lord. Prophet heard the word of the Lord and spoke it to people. He said, prophesy over these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, listen, I will cause breath to enter you and you will live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and I'll put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So, I prophesied as he commanded me and I spoke. And as I spoke, there was a sound and listen, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked and there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, son of man, the Ruach, the spirit, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I spoke as he commanded me, and the spirit, the breath, came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, and there were so many of them. Then God said to me, son of man, this is the house of Israel. That's what these bones are. Behold, they say our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost and we are cut off. Therefore speak and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from the dead. O oh, my people, I will bring you back into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and raise you from the dead, I will put my spirit within you and you will live and I will place you in your own land then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. And so this is the vision that Ezekiel gets and he awakens from the vision and begins to speak to the people and say, this is what God says he will do. We felt like we were literally history. We were done. He says, no, I'll bring life to you. I'll take you back to the land that I promised you. I will make you come alive. Well, how does the story end? Well, that was in 586 BC. I want you to go forward about 50 years. In about 50 years, 539 BC to be exact. Let's put up the next map and I want to show you how the world changed in these 50 years. This is the Persian Empire. The Persians came out of what's modern day Iran and they came boiling out of there in the 6th century the 500s BC, and they literally conquered to the east and they conquered to the west and Cyrus the Persian king came rolling through Babylon and conquered the Babylonians. Turns out the Persians have a different philosophy. They didn't exile people. Cyrus turns to the Jews and he said, you can go home. You can all go back to your land. You're gonna pay me taxes but you're free to go back. In fact, you can rebuild the temple to your God if you want to. And sure enough, in the Old Testament, you're gonna see a book called Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a man who lived after this, who went to Jerusalem and rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem. And you're gonna see a book called Ezra. Ezra was a priest who left exile because the Persians said you can go home. And he went back and he began to teach 
the law of Moses to people. And sure enough, exactly like God said, they literally came back onto the pages of history. Well, that's a powerful story. And my first point is, it is a story in real history, real politics, and God works in real people's lives, just like you and me. But it's not the end of my story. Because you see, everything that happened to Israel was a dress rehearsal for Jesus Christ. You see, everything that happened here was pointing towards Jesus, all of history. All of history points toward Jesus. This story, and it's not a story, this event that happened in the life of Israel over this 50, 60 year period is literally the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, God was foreshadowing. He was rehearsing what he was going to do so that you and I can see it and go, he planned this all along. How much must God love you to not only send his son for you, but to rehearse it, to bring all of humanity along, to take warring empires, to take emperors and kings who were evil and greedy and yet bend them to point to Jesus Christ. Well, let me fast forward about half an inch. Actually, we're going to go forward 600 years and so Jesus has died on a cross. He's been resurrected. And the Apostle Paul, I'm going to pick a few verses, but from now on, when you read your New Testament, you're going to see this all over the place because it's not a coincidence. I want to show you the story of the dry bones and how God made it come true again in Jesus Christ. Paul's writing to a church, believers like you and me, in a town called Ephesus. So it's called the letter to the Ephesians. And he says in chapter two, well, I'll just quote it to you, but it's really interesting. He opens chapter two, verse one, and he says this, as for you, and he's talking to believers, you were dead in your sins and your trespasses that you used to, to live in when you followed the way of this world. You see, what's he saying to us? He said, your trust was misplaced. You were following the ways of this world. You were chasing relationships, money, fame, power, happiness through whatever it may be. And just like the Israelites, you had placed your trust in things that would fail you. You were dead in your sins and your trespasses when you used to live following the ways of this world. By the way, the Bible isn't the only thing that, that thinks this about human life. In fact, every great thinker in history has come to the same conclusion. Let me give you just a couple of examples that you probably will know. Shakespeare, in his play Macbeth, speaks about life as if life, our lives, are like an actor on a stage, strutting and fretting in this anxious hour upon the stage. And he says, but when he's through, you realize that life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, but signifying nothing. What's he saying? He has Macbeth say that, you know what, at the end of the day, our lives are uh, full of sound and fury and anxiety and strutting, and yet at the end it means nothing. Philosopher uh, Henry David Thoreau, famous line, goes something like this, he said, most men, most people, live lives of quiet desperation. What's he saying? He's saying our lives are anxious goings about chasing happiness in all the wrong things. All the great thinkers of history, when they look at human life, fail to find any real meaning, any real point to it. But the Bible doesn't stop there. God says in Ephesians 2.1, you were dead in your sins and trespasses when you used to live following the ways of this world. But God, because of his great mercy, made you alive in Jesus Christ. This is the story of the dry bones. He made you alive in Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. Ezekiel was telling the gospel 
They were saved physically and brought back home, and God was foreshadowing what Jesus Christ would do in anyone who placed their trust in him instead of the things of this world that would fail. Ephesians chapter one, verse 13 says this. Listen to the same language. You've got the dead, you've got the alive, but listen to this. Ephesians 1, 13 says this. When you heard the word of truth, what did Ezekiel do to those bones? Go preach the word of God to them. When you heard the word of truth and you placed your trust in him, you were filled with the Holy Spirit. Spirit, the Ruach, the breath of God was placed inside you. In other words, Paul says in Romans, my old self has died with Christ. I am raised to walk in newness. I tell you this because now when you read the New Testament, everything connects. God planned this so long ago. How much must he love you to have done that? And so our story is that story played out on a cosmic scale. You're gonna see this all over the scriptures. John 10, 10, Jesus comes and he said, I came to give you life. He didn't say I came to like the Buddha to tell you a better way to live or like Confucius tell you the way to get along with people. I came to give you life. You are dry bones and you are dead. You just don't realize it yet. But I came to give you life and I came to give you life to the full the full life. Let me give you one more example. because I think most of you probably know the story in Luke 15 about the prodigal son. Think about that story for a minute. The story's about the older brother. You got dad, older brother, younger brother, and off he goes. The younger brother just is destroying his life. Well, it's a serious story because I've had that experience. I bet you've had that experience with people in our lives and our families. And like that father, you're constantly looking, you're praying, will they come back? Will they come back to Christ? Will they come back to us? And he does. And so he comes to his senses and he comes back. You remember that story? And when he comes back, the father is like, you're here. And he begins to have a great celebration. Well, the older brother, whom I have been on more than one occasion, said, are you kidding me? He did this to himself. He deserves this. But I want to point out to you this one point. The very last verse of that story, the father says, and listen to what he says to the older brother, he said, we have to celebrate because your brother was dead and now he's alive. Do you see the connections? That's the gospel. That's the good news. But it's not just on a cosmic scale. It is. Jesus Christ died on a cross and God forecasted it, not just in the story of the dry bones. When you read the Old Testament, you keep looking for Jesus. You're gonna find him everywhere. He's forecasting what he's going to do through all of history. And he did die for all who will place their trust in Jesus Christ. This is a cosmic Jew, Gentile, male, female. He died that anyone who places their trust in him and follows him will have eternal life. But it's also really very personal. You see, that story of the dry bones is also very true on an individual basis. I think every one of us have parts of our lives that are dry. Let me tell you this. When I read that story of Ezekiel, I don't know about you, but if you just look at it from my point of view, most of what's going on in life is my story and you are extras in it. You feel the same way, don't you? And you're probably right because I'm not starring in any story. I'm pretty sure of that. But the point is, when I read that story, you know who I think I am? Well, I'm Ezekiel. It's like, God, yeah, oh, those are dry. What do you want me to tell them? Yeah, I'll be happy. I'll go prophesy to them. We're not Ezekiel in that story. We're the dry bones in that story. That's who we are in that story. And I think there are parts of our lives, even as Christ followers, that as we grow, we realize there are still parts of our lives that are dry. Maybe that's a marriage that needs to come to life. You see, God can make things come alive that we thought were dead. God can make things possible that we thought were hopeless. Maybe the dry, dry part of our lives are relationship. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a, a brother or sister or mother or father. Whatever it is in our lives, we have parts of our lives that are dry. Maybe we found ourselves that drugs or alcohol 
have gotten a grip on us and it's drying out our life. It's sucking the life out of us. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's greed. Whatever it is, that's what sin does. It dries your life out. It makes us dead like those dry, dry bones. And I don't know what that is in your life, but I know that we all have places in our life that God wants to make alive, that he wants to breathe his life into it. And the only thing standing between us and that is if we will let it go and say, come in, and I'm ashamed to show you this, Lord, but I want you to see the dry bones. And God will breathe into it, and he will make it come alive. Now, I'm gonna pray for us, and when I get through, we're gonna leave, but I want you to know there are gonna be folks up here at the front that would like to pray with you. And all it takes to make the dry bones in your life come, come back to life is simply to turn it over to Jesus Christ. And I'd urge you, surrender to him now and let him breathe life into you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you and we come before you and we have nothing but awe. When we learn what you have done through centuries, through millennia, that you orchestrated all of history, empires and leaders, everything to bring us back to you. You saved us all through Jesus Christ, your son. That if we will surrender to you and we will just realize that we are dead and you make us alive. And on a personal basis, Lord, we, we agree with King David when he said, Lord, who are we that you care for us? Who are we that you love us? And we are overwhelmed with your love. I do pray for all the dry bones here today in my life and everyone's life here that we would open the door and let your spirit come in and breathe life into us. Blessed be your holy name in Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.